Thank you very much. Um, as some of you know, I'm Michael Connolly, and my main role in the British Council is to introduce fellow Irishmen every year at the Tech Conference. Um, last year, I, in I introduced a lady from County Cork, and I said that that was the rebel county. And I gave the impression that Ireland was a warlike country, but it's not at all. This year, we have a man from County Waterford, and Waterford is called the Gentle County. So we have a gentleman from the Gentle County today, which is lovely. Uh, Waterford is famous in Ireland for its tropical weather. In Irish terms, it's 15 degrees centigrade or more. It only rains 200 days a year. It's uh, the Irish Riviera, absolutely wonderful place. And it's also famous for Waterford Crystal. Have you heard of Waterford Crystal? This is expensive glass that we sell to vulnerable tourists in Ireland. It's a very good thing. But today we have Richard, Richard Kiley from County Waterford. And he's also a professor of applied linguistics, linguistics and language education in the Center for International Language Teacher Education at University College Plymouth, St. Mark and St. John. And Professor Kiley is the author with uh, Pauline Ray Dickens of Program Education and uh, Program Evaluation in Language Education. And today he will speak on program evaluation and curriculum development. Um, he will look at how program evaluation activities contribute to processes of improvement of materials, pedagogic strategies, teacher knowledge and skills. Um, I know this is a subject of great interest to us at the British Council, and I'm sure it is to a lot of you in the audience. So, thank you, Professor Kiley. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me at the back? I've got a clip-on mic, and I'm going to be moving around, so I hope it's, uh, it's clear to all of you. I'd like you also to make sure you're sitting near somebody because I want to have little buzz group conversations every so often in my talk so that you don't just listen to me, you also listen to the person um, next to you. I'd like to thank the British Council for giving me the opportunity to attend this conference and to, to speak on, on this topic. And of course, in attending the conference, to listen to so many uh, listen to discussions of so many interesting initiatives uh, in many different parts of India. From attending talks in this conference and also from reading the abstracts, I can see that what I have to say about program evaluation is actually not that new. There's a lot of evaluation activity going on. And what's particularly important is in the subheading I have here. Not the role of program evaluation in curriculum development, but the question, how are we doing? A lot of the papers, a lot of the conversations people have are on that question, how are we doing? Now, the pronoun, for those of you who are linguistically oriented, the pronoun here is terribly important. In the past, in relation to evaluation, the question has been, how are they doing? It's about evaluating other people. How are they doing? Sometimes, particularly in the reflective tradition, you can have the question, how am I doing? And that is very useful. But the really useful question to address is, how are we doing? Now, my name is Richard Kiley, and as Michael said, I'm from Ireland. And I'm giving you a little, a little bit of biography here before we start. It seems my whole life has been a life in program evaluation. When I was a primary school pupil in Ireland, I was part of a big comparative study into the effectiveness of different languages of instruction in the, in the primary school. L1 or L2, which one is better? You can, talk, you can ask me about that one later. When I first became a teacher, or early in my teaching career, I was involved in a native speaker teacher project, which was trying to assess whether English only in the classroom was better than two languages in the classroom. Of course, that one, there was no clear conclusion either. 
I was a consultant in an evaluation for development project. And that was about how when you have a project or an initiative or a new program, evaluation can really add value. The fourth one there, I evaluated a CLEAL project, looking at how CLEAL was implemented in four different countries. And finally, I've been involved as a researcher in a teacher education impact study, looking at how effectively um, an initial teacher education program trains teachers. So in these different roles, pupil, teacher, consultant, evaluator, researcher, this kind of has been my life. And it's what I'm talking to you about today, how these different roles have a part to play in improving our, our programs. Some principles that come from these, these experiences then. Evaluation cannot just test a theory. We've had that in the past where which is better, this method or that method? Let's do an evaluation and find out. We've done the evaluations, they haven't told us which is better. Evaluation has to understand learning processes as well as outcomes. You can't just look at the test results. You have to look at what happened before the test. Evaluation has to engage all stakeholders. It's very important that education is inclusive and that you have all the different voices that contribute to a program implementation that they are heard. Evaluation has to facilitate action. It's very important that when you know something about the program, when you have some new understanding, that that then leads to some action that changes what is done, maybe in some small way, some initially invisible way, barely visible way, but it changes. And finally, evaluation should make sense of the program for everyone. It's very important that we see our programs as mysteries. We don't quite know how they work, but we can solve the mystery. We can shed light on the mystery, solve the puzzle. And that really is what I would like you to see evaluation as focusing on. In this presentation, I'm going to give an overview of language program evaluation and its potential for curriculum and professional development. So this overview is a little bit of, of history, perhaps. I'm going to look in the green section. I have five different colors here, and the heading will have the different color. So if you have had, after the wonderful lunch we've had, if you'd like to have a little uh, afternoon nap, when you wake up, you can check from the color where we are. And if it's not one of these colors, you, you might, might be the next plenary. But in the green one, evaluation purposes, designs, and methods. Some, something we can take uh, from what has happened in the past. The blue one is really important. It's about identities and roles. Who are the people in evaluation, and how do they make a contribution to this idea of curriculum development and to their own professional development? The fourth one, the yellow one, the gold standard, is use of evaluation. What we find out from evaluation, then how are the the processes and outcomes used. And finally, uh, in the brown area, a little bit of discussion of managing change, which is what we, it is one way of looking at the action that comes from it and quite a challenge in our field. Now, in the overview, I'm going to give you a definition of evaluation, which is my own definition from 2009. This is on the the references at the end. And basically here, evaluation is a set of strategies, not one thing, a set of strategies, to document and understand. Before we do an assessment, before we do an evaluation in terms of quality, in terms of good or bad, we must document, that is describe, and we must understand, we must have some make sense of what is going on. Now, there's five things that are important in documenting and understanding. The first one is research activity on aspects of the program. Might be a survey of attitudes or classroom observation studies. The second one there, assessment data. 
we, assessment data is incredibly useful. So when we have test results, they, they tell us a lot, especially when we put them together with these other four. Now, in addition to these, the research and the test data, we have to engage with the social, cultural, and historical identity of the program. No program is newly invented, is a fresh, new project. Everything has a history. And understanding that history is part of understanding the program. A program is a product of an institution. This is one way of understanding it. A British Council teacher education program, a university literature program, an initial program for training teachers in a college. This is a product of the institution. It's also a phase in the biography of the learners, or the biographies of the participants because through our life we are changing. And what happens in a certain project period is part of that long development through life. And the third one in that area, it's a context of personal investments. This is what evaluation can really contribute when it recognizes the investment of individuals. And it also sees, why are people not investing? When I've, I've, I've heard a lot of papers here, well, some papers here, about difficulties people have, and they talk about students not motivated, and students not speaking, what we have there is a question of investment. And we need to ask, why are they not investing? Or we need to ask, why are they not investing in the way we would like them to invest? So these, these five areas then, research activities such as questionnaires or classroom observation study, test data, and then the product of the institution, the biography of participants, and the investments. These are five content areas that evaluation can deal with. Now, this, this history. I call these type one and type two evaluations. Type one is the, a tradition a very strong tradition that has come from outside ELT. It's particularly effective in the evaluation of new medicines, for example, where you have an experimental comparative study with uh, a, an experimental group and a control group. The findings are based on probability. What is the likelihood of success with the experimental option? So this is a probability focus. It's policy-oriented. In education, it's policy-oriented. It comes from the top. There's an explicit program theory. It might be task-based learning is better. Let's have an experimental study to show that. And there's a product focus. We want a result which shows us that the theory can be generalized from, can be extended to other areas. And usually, this kind of evaluation is external. It is done by people outside the program. Type two is what is case study, is probably the best way of describing it. It's based on possibility. It's not asking the question, what is the probability of learning success in this program? It's asking the question, what are the possibilities for learning success in this program? And if we understand the possibilities, we're in a position to take really important action. It's practice-oriented. It takes as its focus, what is it people are doing? What are the practices of the program? What are the practices of teaching that teachers get up to? What are the practices of students? And of course, practices are deeply embedded. They all have their own histories as well. The program theory is very often implicit, multifaceted. It's not really clear why teachers do things in a certain way. It's probably to do with their, their own history or social context. Process, you have a process focus, and it's internal. Typically, these case studies are done within programs, and I'll show you some examples in, in the moment. Now, because of the history we are coming from, and particularly respectful of the theme of this conference, diversity, type one is not that relevant. Type 1 assumes a kind of a standardization across huge contexts and populations. Now, that works, of course, for medicine. 
If you're, if you're testing a new medicine, then the physical operations of our body are the same wherever we are. So if something works for blood pressure in India, it will work for blood pressure in Alaska or Nigeria or Ireland. So where we can standardize like that in the physical world, type 1 is very valuable. But where we have diversity, such as in education and across the social sciences, and there are different histories, different experiences of learning, then the type 1 is not so good. Type 2 is the better, uh, is, is the better option. What I'd like you to do now is to discuss with the person next to you for about 30 seconds. I held 30 seconds in a talk this morning. And just answer, ask the person next to you, are any of these features new to you? I'm not going to take feedback now, but we'll have time for questions at the end. So just a 30 second break for you to talk and get to know the person next to you. Now, as with all buzz groups, the minute I hear a good buzz going, I have to say, time to stop. But I hope you learned something interesting about the person next to you. If we move on to the next slide, we're into the green section already, evaluation purposes, designs, and methods. I've got three points here. Purposes, we do evaluation for accountability. We are in education. Very often, we are doing two things that are always going to leave us accountable. We are spending public money in education, and we must account for that. And the second thing, particularly in ELT, we are asking people to give a lot of their time, particularly students, particularly in a context like India, from primary through secondary through university. We are asking people to invest their time in learning English. This investment of time by students is an, another context of accountability. And, and then you have uh, development quality assurance going along with that. Designs, we want to focus on the links between data, theory, and action. And we'll come back to this point about designs in different evaluation types uh, uh, later. And then we have methods. These are the ways of getting data, which are quite challenging. When we focus on practices, then we'll see how challenging that is. If we look at type 1, these are the big experimental comparative studies. We have two types, two designs there. Template one is you focus just on the measurement of outcomes. You answer the question, how are we doing? Look at the test results. This is very often how schools are evaluated, how whole, whole uh, districts or states are evaluated. Look at the test results. You might also have uh, teacher performance, uh, teacher qualifications. They can be looked at. Template two there is surveys of attitudes, attitude studies, um, preferences, aspirations, needs, wants. And these can give us uh, a, a picture there. The designs uh, in that kind of evaluation are very much in that domain. Now, in, template, in, in type two, there are three templates I set out here. We can have this kind of case study evaluation, and it can focus at on something like quality assurance. We do evaluation to assure quality, just to make sure we're doing things in the best way we can, and we're doing it like that for every course. The second one, we do evaluation for program support, particularly important in innovative context, where we are asking teachers and learners to engage in new teaching and learning activities, perhaps around technology, perhaps around uh, different ideas in language teaching. And we need to support those innovative initiatives, and evaluation can help us do that. And then template three is a much more teacher-led one. It is teacher research. And we have another short buzz group discussion here. What kind of activities do you think would contribute to these designs? So another 30 seconds, continue your little uh, chat with the person next to you, and see what kind of activities do you think are going to be in the table below in the next slide. OK, let's see, let's see if you got it, if you, if you are in the right area there. This is what I've got from, from the work that I've been doing. I've got lists something like this. 
Basically, in the quality assurance, we are looking at maybe end-of-course questionnaires, different kinds of surveys, focus groups, audits, which might be attendance registers, something like that, uh, assessment data, how the students are doing in the tests. And all of these are processes of evaluation which serve the remit of quality assurance. And if that works well, it is quality enhancement as well. Because as people see, oh, they like this, gosh, this worked well, then you get an enhancement effect. The second one, program support. When, when you have something new that is organized for teachers. And here you have things like mentoring, peer observation, reading circles, assessment workshops, meetings. When you introduce, for example, blended learning, and you're having uh, teachers accommodate to that, it's a huge challenge to have teachers who maybe for 10 or 20 years have been teaching in the classroom. And now they are told, teach 50% in the classroom, 50% on the internet. How do you do that? They need support. And these, the, the mentoring, peer observation, reading circles, actually the guidance you give to teachers, they can read it on their own. But if they read it on their own and then they come together in an organized way to talk about it, what makes sense, what doesn't, enormously supported. And this then, this is evaluative. This helps people to make sense of what they're supposed to be doing. And then finally, teacher research. Well, there's no shortage of labels here. And I, I would say at an overview level, of course, many people will disagree with this, that these forms of inquiry share many features. We can bundle them together into this basket of activity. Some, in some places, it might be called action research. In other places, it might be called reflective practices. Uh, following Dick Allwright, it might be exploratory practice. And in some cases, it might be study for a higher degree. A teacher or a project leader might be doing her master's, and her dissertation might be an evaluation of a certain program. Or even doctoral study. It involves this examination of practices. This is terribly important, and I'll tell you why. Because in study for higher degrees, you sometimes manage the time resource to do classroom observation, and to do classroom observation in a systematic way. If the person is not doing a, a well-resourced master's, an MA, or a PhD, it will be almost impossible to find the time to do a systematic classroom observation. So these are terribly important. Of course, the ideal situation is you have all of these going on. The QA stuff is kind of going on all the time. The program support is responsive to what is a concern for teachers, what teachers are finding interesting, what teachers are finding difficult. And then the teacher research is what individual teachers, in their phase of their biography, you know, even for the worst motives, they can do interesting research. And the worst of motives, in my experience, is teachers want to do a PhD, and they want to do a PhD involving classroom, in, uh, classroom observation. They want to study how is it, what is it that students learn when they're working in groups, when they are preparing for oral presentations. What's the motive for the teacher doing that study? To get out of the classroom and become a university lecturer and not be a teacher anymore. And that's OK. That's OK. But that work that's done in explaining how collaborative learning in the classroom and outside, that can be valuable for so many people when it is completed, when it is shared, and it can tell people in that program how their program works, even though the teacher who does it may then go on and do something completely different um, outside. Now, the questions we have in terms of evaluation designs, when we have a focus there on template one, template two, template three, the design issues, how do we find the right amount of activity? Of course, teachers are very busy people. They've got classes to teach, they've got lessons to prepare, they've got work to mark, tests to mark. In some places, they have a second job. And then, as well as that, they have a family to look after or whatever. How much of this can we expect people to do? 
how do we get a focus on learning? How valuable are the outcomes of evaluations in terms of telling us about how people learn? This is what's really important. How do people learn? And then, how do we add value to learning opportunities? The idea of adding value is, this works, but only for 50% of the students. Your policy person will say, it should work for 100% of the students. But that's impossible. But you can say, how can we make it work for 60% of the students, not 50%? Let's have we include another 10% in the success in this initiative, in the participation in uh, uh, internet platform in blended learning. So we can finally, we can find through understanding the processes, ways of involving more people and of adding value in that way. Now, moving on to the blue section, we have identities and roles of program stakeholders. And right in the middle there, we have teachers. Teachers, uh, teachers are very important. They don't do the learning, but they are the way of changing the thinking of the learners. You know, when we want to have innovative approaches, when we want to have use of internet, mobile learning, uh, use of out-of-class learning, uh, use of posters, uh, visual learning approaches, they can only be accessed by students and pupils when the teachers are the medium, when teachers mediate that kind of participation by the students. So I would put teachers in the center. And who do I have next? Students. The students are always very important. And we must always have a place in evaluation for hearing the voice of the students. We can do a survey, we can give them a questionnaire. We, you know, that's valuable. But there are other ways we can go beyond that. We have teacher educators. Not just initial teacher trainers, or, but, but the people who are supporting teachers all the way through. Maybe mentors in the school, senior teachers like, like heads of department, or we might have um, people outside doing special training around technology or something like that. So a lot of people can be in the role of teacher educators. Then we have leaders and managers, a little bit more remote, but they have a role in evaluation as well. They are the ones who might have an overview that people close to the classroom might not have. And finally, we have remote stakeholders. Remote, who would the more remote stakeholders be? Yes, we will have people like um, remote stakeholders there, managers, sponsors, parents, employers. And these are, uh, you know, when, they, when you take parents as a stakeholder in the program, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, of course, it can be a source of annoyance for a lot of teachers when a parent comes in waving an exercise book and say, spelling mistakes, you missed the spelling mistake in my child's book. You know, it can be difficult. But actually, when parents are involved like that, it's a great opportunity because they become partners in learning. But going back to the immediate stakeholders, the students and the teachers, students we can construct in various ways. A very modern construction of student is they are the customers and our education service, particularly universities in many parts of the world, they are constructed as a service industry and the students are kind of their clients or their customers. Well, they can be learners, which is a very, a very instrumental kind of role for them. We can think of them as participants. How many of you ever refer to your students as participants? Think about that. Or practitioners. We speak about the practice of teaching, but we also have the practice of learning, or the practices of learning. We have many, I have so many stories of the practices of learning in this conference, from Adrian Holliday's talk the other day to, to, to people um, talking about all sorts of informal learning. If we see our students as practitioners in the art of learning, and then we ask them to think about what kind of practitioner in the art of learning are you? They might say, if they're a good student, they might say, oh, ma'am, I do what you tell me. 
And you say, well, that's okay, but you can do much more than that. So this becomes a context to develop our students, to enhance their practices of learning when we begin to see them as practitioners of learning. Teachers can be transformers or transmitters. And they have to ask, it's very good for teachers to think, are you a transmitter? Are you a transformer? Are, you're both. What kind of mix are you? Which one are you happiest with? Which one would you like to extend? What makes it possible for you to be a transformer? What makes it impossible? We can also see our teachers as advisors. This kind of goes along with the students as practitioners of learning. Or we can see them as assessors. And this, of course, is a double-edged sword. Assessment can be uh, a, a constraint in learning, a limitation. But assessment can also be the construction of learning opportunities. And we all know the good students, the good practitioners of learning, are the students who love to do well in the tests. So they have that part. The, the role of the teacher as, uh, as assessor is important in their practice of learning. So what we have to do is involve our students in learning, using the processes and outcomes of, of evaluation for the improvement of evaluation. And there, what, what I say is we work. I'm not going to give you a workshop now or a workshop activity. The point is you must workshop the ways in which your students can be better, better learners. For example, um, ah, I have a buzz group discussion here. You tell me, have 30 seconds, I think it's time for another 30 seconds. How can teachers workshop evaluation process, the evaluation process with their students? So I'll give you 30 seconds to get to know the person next to you a bit better. Okay, I think you're finally getting into the, the discussion, and, and I'll move on. The processes I have here, and it's interesting for you to see if you've had, if you've had those, you can have awareness raising with your students just in the conversation in the class, just making them aware of why it is you want them to do certain things. Share with them your rationale for activities. Focus groups, you can have organized group discussions with your students, so they're, they're a way of, of doing that. Or structured discussions, which work in a, in a similar way. And you can have reflections as part of assessments. So instead of just doing a writing assignment about uh, a, a particular composition title, can you extend that and ask them to write a reflective piece on what doing that assignment was like for them. What was important? What was valuable? What did they do? Did they use a dictionary? What did they use the dictionary for? Did they ask somebody else? Did they get, get assistance with it? And if you can introduce that reflection as part of writing, as part of text creating, spoken text as well, then I think you involve your students in understanding what works, how does it work for them as, as individuals and as groups? I go back to 1991, a very interesting book by Legutki and Thomas, 20-something um, years ago now, which makes exactly this point. Engaging learners in, commu uh, in communicative encounters, especially if the aim is to explore emotional content and experience, can become too bound up in itself unless the activity also reaches an evaluation stage. It becomes too bound up in itself. There's a, a question about the purpose of it. And very often students will have that. Students say, but why are we doing this? This is a waste of time. I want to do multiple choice questions to prepare for the test. Some, you know, you can get the feedback like that. So what this is, trying to understand what has happened while undertaking a particular task why it was suggested by the teacher. This is what's very important to share. Why is the teacher asking me to do this? The students will always have an answer to that question, but very often their answer is not the correct one. And they can share the teacher's understanding of the curriculum and of the learning opportunities. And contributing actively to the evaluation of learning arrangements, sequences, resources, and input materials 
by means of reflection and metacommunicative discourse, all these are considered indispensable learner activities in ELL. So this is a, a cause from a long time ago that we're only now beginning to see implemented with the involvement of students in understanding the rationale of the process. I think I'd better stay here. You can hear me, you can hear me now. Has this one gone off then, yeah? Okay. Um, Autonomy, agency, and there's another star coming. What's in the next star? What are the benefits that will flow from involving your students? Motivation. So this is a, a kind of a driving of the learning power of a program. If you can increase the autonomy of the students, increase their sense of agency, their sense of what they can do for themselves, and then increase their motivation, to continue along that route, there's a chance you'll have better, uh, better outcomes. Now, using evaluation, here we're into the, the, the yellow phase, the golden area, and this is teachers in a community of practice. This is uh, very, uh, very important, that teachers do not work in isolation. There's a long tradition, and there's a lot of research in education supporting it, that teachers in very, very social environments tend to work to a large degree in isolation. And they don't really share with their colleagues what goes on in their classrooms. Yes, they will complain about their students, they'll, they'll complain about uh, the, the amount of work, they'll complain about lots of things, but actually talk about what it is they do in the classroom and maybe the questions they have about that, that's quite rare. So when we have teachers in a community of practice, we have teachers sharing, we have teachers making sense together of what it is their enterprise is. Now what I'm suggesting here are Activities like collaborative development, which might be peer observation, mentoring, coaching. Not relationships assigned by the head teacher or the principal or the program leader, but really kind of informal teachers getting together. These are incredibly valuable in using evaluation. Similarly, where you have workshops on, on materials, on ICT and, and use of multimedia, assessment formats, test data. Excellent when teachers come together and decide, what does this mean? What are we doing? Uh, how can we improve it? We've had surveys from the students. We've had feedback from the students. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we make the most of this? Another uh, buzz group session for you here. And the question is, do these happen in your context? And if not, why not? Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully you have discussed something that might um, give, you, give us an opportunity for you to make a comment or ask a question later. I want to move on now to this view of teacher professionalism and a quote from uh, Constant Learn, who talks about two kinds of professionalism of teachers. Sponsored professionalism, which he calls the qualification level, if you like, uh, qualifications, recognition, role within an institution, okay? So this is something that says something about your professionalism. But the second type, which he regards as the more powerful driver of learning for teachers, is independent professionalism. And this he describes as a commitment to careful and critical examination of the assumptions and practices embedded in sponsored professionalism. So this is where teachers, they don't just do what they're told. They do what they're told, but they say, am I being told the best thing to do? And what can I do about it? Now certainly I saw a lot of evidence in this conference over the last three days on uh, of independent professionalism, a lot of critical voices. And that bodes very well because I think once this 
starts, once it becomes part of the culture of an institution, then you get a kind of a bottom-up development. You have teachers not waiting for the, the leader of the institution to say what should be done, but you have teachers from their particular position saying, why don't we go in this direction? How about we do, we do this? The next section that I want to go on to now is teachers and change. And I want to tell you a little story here about some research I did uh, um, quite a while ago, looking at teachers in the UK using evaluation to develop the program. And I looked at what it was they were doing, and I interviewed this teacher called Millie. And they had a lot of interesting feedback from the students. And what Millie said was, to the question, will you do it differently next time? And what answer was I expecting? Yes, we'll do it differently. But Millie said, I don't think I'll do it differently. We have developed some good strategies and some quite good materials, and that will continue to develop. So it's not a change of direction, but perhaps going further in the same direction. So was this teachers not listening to their students? Well, part of my study was to follow this small group of teachers teaching a university program. And the next teacher I looked at was a teacher called Anna. And I, what I looked, this is what I came up with. I hope you can all see that. The writing is a bit small. But Anna is the teacher. And Anna got feedback from students suggesting less attention to explaining words in class. Okay. Now, when they were doing reading comprehension, there were two kinds of students. There were students who liked to the teacher to explain all the difficult words. And then they wrote the meaning of the words, and the teacher went through the lesson like that. Other students said, this is spoon feeding. We don't need the teacher to tell us the meaning of the word. We can use the dictionary. But when got the feedback from students saying, don't spoon feed us, we can look up the words ourselves. So Anna's response was resistance. She interprets this as selfish thinking on the part of the students. So she resists. Then there's a reflection that comes through in the interviews where she realizes, she rationalizes, this might not be the best way of using, she rationalizes that this might not be the best way of using classroom time. So what she does is she introduces a pedagogy which focuses on comprehension of ideas rather than individual words. So she gets the feedback from the students, she resists this, she then reflects on it, and she then innovates to accommodate to what the students want. And I found one cycle of this in a, a course over one semester. And then the next semester, and I got feedback from the students suggesting more attention to explaining the words in class. So she re resisted that one and said they should focus on broad swains of meaning. And I shouldn't be telling you what this word means, what that word means. So then she reflected again. This group say they want, they want it. So I try to do it for them. And she includes a short activity in week six. And then she spends more time on vocabulary, individual words, in weeks nine and 10, and provides a vocabulary tasks to te texts in weeks 11 and 12. So this is an example here where one teacher, Millie, says, no, 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 we're not just going to go with what the students say. We don't respond in that way. But then Anna, shows us we have feedback, we have resistance, we have reflection, we have innovation. So that actually uh, teachers do respond to student feedback, but not immediately. There's, uh, and, you know, teachers take time, need time to take stock, to incorporate those ideas into their own thinking, and then find a way of implementing them. And many teachers I have studied show some form of this cycle. If we look at the next slide there, these are some of my conclusions on teachers and change. Change is gradual, perhaps not always visible to the naked eye. 
This is why research is very important, because research makes visible what is not visible in our ordinary practices. Change occurs at the teacher's pace. This is very important. You cannot make teachers do things they believe are not possible for them. If you're in teacher education, you have to find a way to make this new activity possible for the teachers. Change is negotiated. But the more optimistic point, change happens. We're human. We all live human lives. Things do not remain the same. We think they remain the same. I'm sure if you organize a family wedding uh, here in uh, India, Hyderabad, some part of India, you will think, oh, I'm having a traditional Indian wedding. And you will think about all the traditions. But somebody who experienced that wedding this year and who had their last Indian wedding 30 years ago we say, oh, so many things are different now. When I was at a traditional wedding 30 years ago, it was so different. Why? Because our practices in life change. Things move on. So change happens. It's a question of understanding where it's coming from, understanding where it's going, understanding what it means for us. Some guidelines. I started off by saying evaluation cannot just test the theory. Evaluation has to understand learning processes as well as outcomes. Evaluation has to engage with all stakeholders. Evaluation has to facilitate action. And evaluation should make sense of the program for everyone. I would say use evaluation to explain what is going on. Use it to answer the how are we doing question. Use it to allow voices to be heard. Use it to act for improvement, and use it to raise awareness and explain. These are some references, and thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Kylie. That was wonderful. We have um, a bit of time for some questions. So if you could raise your hands. Can I remind you to ask short questions rather than making long statements? Thank you very much. So could we have some hands? Okay, we've got a gentleman in a white shirt towards the front. Uh, what's the contribution of modern technology uh, apart from making evaluation more objective and more accurate? Has it contributed in any big way to improve the quality of evaluation? Um, well, yes and no. Yes, it has made an enormous contribution. And I'll explain in a few ways why. But no, I don't, think, I don't think it makes it more objective, actually. I don't think that's the contribution it makes. But I think when we are doing surveys, um, SurveyMonkey is a wonderful tool. If people are internet users, have access to a laptop, SurveyMonkey is a great tool. Uh, I, for most of my work in evaluation, was distributing and collecting back paper questionnaires, and uh, that's very hard work. But I think, you know, the most interesting way are blogs and uh, reflective spaces that people can have, uh, and the internet is a wonderful opportunity for that. So where you have some kind of blended learning, some kind of, le uh, of learning platform that gathers data. It kind of is like a conversation. But really interesting conversations within programs are not recorded, are not preserved. But when you have it in, um, in, in blogs or wikis or reflective uh, forums or any kind of a forum where people put what they really think, then I think you have a way as an evaluator, as an understander of the program, the technology helps enormously, uh, enormously there. So I think in those ways, the technology is, is very valuable. Okay. okay, we'll just move over to the left-hand side, the gentleman with the glasses in the second row. Sir, apart from managers, sponsors, parents, employers, do you not think that society is also the greatest uh, remote stakeholder? Yes, particularly, I think, when it comes to accountability. But, but when we take those people I call remote stakeholders, 
when we um, when we take the, the the stake of the parents, for example, if we are looking at publicly funded programs in a democratic society, those parents are voters. So those parents are doing a service to the wider democratic polity in that they are the ones who are close to the experience of this publicly funded service and they give that feedback. If, of course, it's not a publicly funded program, it's, if it's a fee-paying program, then the parents, you, you have that, um, you have that uh, uh, um, loop as well. When you have groups like employers, if you are doing something around um, uh, employability, and I, I saw a couple of abstracts and attended one or two talks here which were focusing on employability and readiness to use English in the workplace. And of course the employers become the representatives of the wider society in that, uh, in that context. And of course we have to, we have to be a little bit skeptical. Uh, when you have employers of university graduates and you ask the employers, are the university graduates coming to you with a level of English that you are happy with? What will they answer? No. No, their English is terrible. I don't know what they're doing in university. They should really improve the way they teach English there. When I get them and they can't do this and they can't do that. So employers will always complain. You know, we, we want the standard to be higher. Because, uh, because that will help them make more money. Of course they will want that. But that's it. They are representatives of wider society. So I would hope in this view that these remote stakeholders are that bridge, if you like. They are people who have that close stake in the program, but are also representative of the wider society. Thank you. Um, we have um, just over here on the right-hand side, lady with the glasses. Could you uh, please unfold possibility in type two in the slide? Could, sorry, could I? Uh, unfold the word possibility in type two. Explain. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I do. I think in the past, if I can just go back to my initial explanation and move on from there, the distinction I make between a probability focus and a possibility focus. Now, when you do a probability, usually at the end, and you're making a distinction, like between two medicines, a, this medicine had this success rate, uh, the other one, or the sugar pill, the placebo, had this success rate. Therefore, the probability tells us it's an effective medicine. That doesn't really work with English language teaching methods or course books. But when we have a possibility focus, we're asking the question, what is it possible for learners to achieve in this program? Now, if you work for a private uh, language institute, if you work for a university that is trying to recruit students, they will write, it is possible to achieve this, it is possible to achieve that, it is possible to achieve something else. But this is kind of marketing discourse. We must really be a bit skeptical about that. But within the program, Teachers have an, a deep insight into what is possible. And when you look at excellent learning, then that is possible. It might be only 5% of students who achieve that excellent outcome. But the reality is that is possible. It was possible for 5%. Okay, it was not possible for 95%, but it was possible for 5%. How can we understand what was going on with the 5% for whom it was possible? That will give us a kind of an analysis of possibilities that might us allow, allow us to include more. 8%, 10%, 15%. And then you have more and more excellent and very good outcomes. You're not just looking at the average. You're not looking at the minimum. You're looking at what is an excellent learning experience, what is possible for those, and then how can we understand it and spread it around. That's what I have in mind. Thank you. Thank you. We just move back over to the left. Yes. So my question is, would you recommend making changes to a program 
based on the feedback received from students after a single cycle or maybe a couple of cycles to figure out what's happening? I wouldn't recommend it, no. But I would recommend the teachers think about it. And they, they see, I think your, your question is absolutely spot on. Feedback, evaluation feedback from a single cohort of students. And like Millie in, in my account here, it is appropriate for the teachers to be skeptical of that. But that doesn't mean the students didn't say it. And then I think, but, but you do get something. I know, for example, in, um, in uh, blended learning contexts, when you set up blended learning first, with the best of intentions, you can end up with impossible demands on students to do this online, to do that online, to then attend class, then do something else online. And so many of them get confused, and so many of them don't maximize their learning. And probably the teachers, after the first time of doing a blended learning program, are converting uh, an established face-to-face -face, uh, course uh, converting that to a blended learning formula, you probably do need to make changes based on the experience of students, the recommendations of students. So I would recommend teachers think very carefully about it. Okay, thank you. We'll have uh, maybe a couple more questions. There's a gentleman with a check shirt. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, related to the researchers, research as a program evaluator. When we have large scales programs being evaluated, where the number of stakeholders involved in it is a little too much than what we expect, mm -hmm. then we go for the statistics. Now, in so, such cases, when, uh, I mean, I've been listening to Holiday and your presentation, and both the presentations, subjective evidence that we draw from s certain stakeholders take importance. Mm -hmm. It has a role to play, whether it is while the process is in the progress or at the end of the process. So where do you place this kind of uh, subjective evidence within this framework of program evaluation? What quality of generalizability we assign to this? I think when you have uh, large-scale programs, you have to generalize. You don't, you, you potentially, you tell many, many, many stories, but you are, you are trying to, to uh, see what is the pattern what is the trend across so many uh, different environments um, that there is a risk you will, miss, you will miss a lot. I think the, uh, it, it, it's very hard to say without a specific program, a specific uh, large-scale project, a specific range of contexts. But I do know, for example, in, um, in my own experience, uh, 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 some of the studies, uh, well, let me give you an example of the large-scale study uh, of uh, medium of instruction, language as medium of instruction. When I was a primary school pupil in the late 1950s, when I studied the evaluation later, I read a book on this project. The book was published in America by Professor John McNamara in the early 1960s. And that said that the Irish language kind of immersion program was not successful and it led to lower learning outcomes in general. And the recommendation was do not do primary education in L2 primary education is more effective in the L1 of the children, if at all possible. And I read that, and I thought, but I had a wonderful experience of that. That really worked for me. I learned the two languages okay, I was the best student in the class, and it worked for me, you know? But in general, it didn't. So we have to remember, when we generalize across hundreds of schools, thousands of students, what we find is a general pattern which might indicate a change of policy, and this is, is wholly correct. But within that, we will have cases where the difference is true. What didn't work for everyone does work for a person here and there. And actually, that's a legitimate study as well. 
those, uh, those outliers, those counterintuitive cases, they can tell us something as well. So where we have the resources, where we have the time to look at the richness of data, to drill down into as individual a context or a situation as possible, then that will give us not only the general pattern, which a large-scale evaluation does, but some of the wrinkles as well, some of the, the, the counterintuitive stories in that pattern. And that we should aim for if it's at all possible in terms of the resources for data analysis and the resources of time. Thank you. Okay. I think that we'll wrap that up and yeah. thank you very much professor kylie that was very interesting and thank you to everyone for wonderful questions thank, thank you thank you very much